Topic Notes 2.2, The Effects of Ocean Chemistry. So previously, we talked about the chemistry of the ocean specifically, you know, everything from salinity to dissolved gases, things like that. Now we're going to talk about how those things impact the natural environment and the marine world. And specifically, you can look at this fish. This is a rainbow parrotfish. I took this picture down on Lou Key Reef in the Keys. And parrotfish, just like all other fish, have to deal with the fact that they're swimming in a saltwater environment. Um, there's osmotic pressure involved. And so we're going to get into all that stuff today. Of course, we always start off with our big main ideas. And here it is. The chemical and physical properties of seawater affects the distribution of dissolved oxygen, the formation of the ocean layers, and adaptations used by marine organisms for these conditions. Now, of course, this breaks down into our learning goals, where we're going to get very more specific about various different components of the marine environment, such as uh, the distribution of dissolved oxygen, how temperature and salinity affect density, um, about osmotic pressure and marine life. So make sure you pay attention to these learning goals. They're also in your learning scales that you get in class. Now oxygen is really important for most animal life, including marine life. However, the concentration of dissolved oxygen varies throughout the ocean. Generally speaking, the higher the water temperature, the lower the dissolved oxygen, and the higher the salinity, also the lower the dissolved oxygen. You can see this trend reflected in the graph to the right, where you have temperature on the x-axis and dissolved oxygen on the y. From here, you can see the cooler temperatures, 0 to 5 degrees Celsius, have the higher dissolved oxygen, and that correlates with salinity. You can see that top purple line is zero parts per thousand, so it's very low salinity. And the highest dissolved oxygen you have in those colder waters. This is why uh, in estuaries, when you have a lot of evaporation and it's very hot in the summer, the, salt can, the salinity can get very high, and the temperature can get very high, and the dissolved oxygen can get very low. Now the surface layer of the ocean, generally the first 200 meters, tends to have the most mixing. And thus, out of that, the first 100 meters or so tends to have the highest dissolved oxygen. This can actually reach supersaturation, and that's due to all of the mixing. You have at the surface of the ocean, you have a lot of mixing with the atmosphere from turbulence and whatnot, and also surface currents that drive that mixing deeper. You also have, because sunlight is available, a lot of photosynthesis. And of course, a byproduct of photosynthesis is oxygen. Below that surface layer, you begin to decrease in dissolved oxygen rather dramatically. This is where we have the oxygen minimum layer. And that's the layer within the ocean where the concentration of dissolved oxygen is at its lowest. And it's generally between 100 and 1,000 meters deep. In this zone, marine life have special adaptations to deal with low dissolved oxygen. Most of the organisms found here are fairly inactive, which reduces their need for oxygen. The gills of fish in this area are incredibly efficient at extracting oxygen from water, even at the low levels present at this layer. Additionally, some of the organisms here have a very oxygen efficient form of hemoglobin. And if you remember what that is, it's that blood protein responsible for carrying oxygen throughout the body. Below the oxygen minimum zone, dissolved oxygen levels actually start to increase. There's a few reasons for this. First of all, the solubility of oxygen increases with decrease in temperatures and increase in pressure. Now, the deeper you go, generally the density and diversity of marine life tends to decrease as well. And there's a few reasons for this. Obviously, there's no sunlight, so food is a bit scarce. And thus, you don't have those large populations, and thus you don't have as much respiration going on, which conserves the amount of oxygen that's around. Now, let's turn our attention to the density of seawater.
So density is something you've talked about back in middle school as well. And it is generally written as D equals M over V. Otherwise, density equals mass divided by volume, right? And how much stuff is in a given volume. Now, when we talk about salinity and temperature and how they affect density, this is where we get into a lot of variations in terms of how the ocean is structured. So we'll start with salinity. If you add salt to water, it increases the density. Basically, the mass of the water increases. Now, when it comes to temperature, there's an inverse relationship between temperature, volume, and density. So as you increase the temperature, make it warmer, the volume increases, and thus the density decreases. Oppositely, if you decrease the temperature, you make it colder, you're going to decrease the volume and thus increase the density. In the example in the diagram to the right, you'll see three beakers of water. On the, the leftmost beaker, there's a yellow bag and it's floating on top. The beaker on the far right with the green bag is floating on the bottom or kind of settled on the bottom. And then, of course, the orange bag in the middle beaker is sort of almost neutrally buoyant right in the middle of the beaker. You could easily say that the yellow bag is full of warm, fresh water. And you could say the green bag is cold, salty water. You see, density differences cause water masses to move up or down in the water column. Now, when you're looking at the open ocean, temperature is more important when it comes to density. Think of it this way. In the tropics, uh, generally there is high salinity, but the water is very, very warm. And so it tends to still remain less dense and it doesn't sink so much. In the North Atlantic, the salinity is lower, but the water is much colder. And thus that density causes the water to sink. Now, we're going to get into a lot more about that later when we talk about something called thermohaline circulation, and that even ties into our global climate as well. So stay tuned. On the other hand, near shore, salinity tends to be a bigger factor in terms of density and layering of water. Freshwater runoff and evaporation are going to have a much larger effect in a near shore community with much less water volume going on. This is especially true in estuaries and bay areas, as well as just along the beach. And I'm sure if you've been out on the beach and swimming around, you might have dived down once and noticed you hit a very cold pocket of water or a warm pocket of water here and there. These masses are characteristics of various densities defined by salinity and temperature. So what does this mean for the ocean as a whole? The ocean is actually formed a number of layers, and these layers are based on density differences. At the surface, you have what we call the mixed zone, and this extends to about 200 meters, around 656 feet. And it's an, a zone that's warmed by solar heating, so there's lots of stuff. There's wave action, there's surface currents, which we'll talk about uh, later on down the road. It's a lot of turbulence and mixing, and so it gets a lot of action. Now, beneath the surface zone, you have what we call the transition zone. This goes from about 200 meters to 1,000 meters, or around 3,300 feet or so. Now, in this particular zone, it's a transition from that surface zone to the deep zone. There tends to be what we call a thermocline, or a zone of rapid temperature change. Uh, and you can see that in the graph to the right as the surface tem temperatures are pretty warm. And then you have this uh, shelf, if you will, in the graph that represents this rapid change of temperature. And then you'll notice the temperature starts to level out and stay more consistent all the way to the deeper depths. This is due to changes in temperature. But remember, temperature and uh, salinity do combine here. So you can also put another graph up here very similar to that and show the halocline. And then, of course, if you combine the concepts, 
into just density, you have what we call the pycnocline that you can look at. All three are generally related and can be found in the same zone within the ocean. Now, the thermocline is slightly different than what you would notice in nearshore environments when you dive down and you hit that cold or warm pocket of water. Um, those are thermoclines, but they're kind of nearshore transient ones. What we're talking about here in the transition zone is kind of the major thermocline in the ocean. Now, the deep zone is usually below a thousand meters, and it's generally relatively stable, both in salinity and in temperature. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't some fluctuations, but for the most part, it's relatively stable and consistent. Now, again, all of these layers fluctuate slightly, and they are a part of a larger current system that we're going to get on into a little bit later on in the year. But for the discussion of how the chemistry of the ocean, specifically salinity, affects uh, ocean layers and how that stratifies, this is where we're going to leave it for now. Now let's turn our attention to marine life, because of course all of this stuff that we're talking about, dissolved oxygen, salinity, densities, all these sorts of things, affect them very specifically. And so uh, this picture is actually from one of our local reefs, it's MacArthur Beach State Park, and the fish that you see predominantly there with the bars and the yellow in there are the sergeant majors, which is a type of damselfish we have here in the Atlantic. So what's really going on? The first thing we got to learn is the difference between passive and active transport within cells. Now, this is something you reviewed during biology days. So again, I'll just go through it relatively quickly. First, diffusion. Diffusion is the tendency for a liquid or a gas or solute, salt for example, to flow from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. This happens in nature all the time, this flow from high to low concentration. And this ha happens in a passive manner, meaning there's not a lot of, there's no energy involved. It just sort of happens. Now we're going to get into osmosis. Osmosis is really what we're talking about is water. It's a process in which the solvent, water, diffuses across a semi-permeable membrane, which example would be a cell wall, from an area of less concentrated to more concentrated solute. Now this might seem weird because I just stated that things mostly go from an area of high concentration to low concentration, but in truth it really is doing that because we're talking about the movement of water, not the solute or the salt. So if you look at the image here in the diagram, you'll see on the right side, there's the green represents all the salt and the little blue spheres represent the water molecules. Well, there's a much higher concentration of salt on the right side compared to the left side. So the water is going to be moving from the left to the right to basically try and dilute the salt. Now we'll talk about active transport. This is the process in which the cell moves materials from low concentration to high concentrations, and it requires energy. So the cell membrane is nonpolar, it's hydrophobic. So things like salts that dissolve in water uh, and they have ionic charges, full ionic charges, they can't really pass through the cell membrane um, using passive transport. Water molecules can pass through the membrane because remember, even though they have partial charges, they're not a full ionic charge by any means. And so they have that ability to get through the membrane, hence why they can ov overcome things through passive transport. So when we look at cells in general, there can be three possibilities. You can be hypertonic, which basically means the cells have a higher concentration of salts inside the cell than the surrounding water. In this case, water generally will diffuse into the cell. We have isotonic, which would be the cell that where the salt concentrations inside and outside are about equal, which means there's really no osmotic pressure one way or the other in terms of direction of water flow. And then there's hypotonic. And in this case, the cells have a lower concentration of salt than the surrounding water. And water diffuses out of the cell. So in general, marine organisms will lose water through osmosis when the concentration of salts is higher outside the cell compared to inside the cell. 
basically you have cells trying to dilute the ocean, which doesn't work so well. So there's a couple of options to deal with this. First of all, you have marine organisms that are osmoconformers. What that means is they basically say, okay, we're going to make the salinity inside the cell and outside the cell about the same so we don't lose water. Basically, the cells are isotonic. A lot of invertebrates are osmoconformers as well as a lot of algaes. <laughs> so these are the two pictures that you're seeing there. The other option are osmoregulators. Now, this is where the cells have a lower salt concentration than the ocean environment. That means the cells are hypotonic. In this case, they need to employ active transport to adjust the water concentration within their cells because they're going to continually lose water through osmosis. Most bony fish do this, and of course marine mammals, which are like us, do this as well. Now to go into the example of fish a little bit more, fish basically replace the water they lose through osmosis by consuming lots of seawater, and they excrete only small amounts of urine. All right, so they retain as much water as they can. And they also use specialized glands in their gills to uh, basically get rid of and eliminate excess salt. Now, if you look at a freshwater fish, they're not designed to do that. So if you put them in salt water, like a bass or a bluegill or something, they're not going to have those adaptations and they're generally going to die pretty quickly in salt water. If you look at the diagram on the right, you'll basically know that they excrete a lot more water in their urine. And this is a problem if you're going to retain the water that you're losing through osmosis in salt water. Now there are other types of adaptations uh, that other organisms use. So now I'm going to turn it over to you. And here's the question. How do sharks regulate salinity? Are they osmoconformers or osmoregulators? They're a little bit of an interesting case, so I'll let you figure it out on your own and write it down in your note summaries. Till next time, keep thinking.